Uh, and so you can look at that and say, well, they don't really know exactly what the outcome is going to be. I mean, they can project and pretend and go off of whatever indicators they want and say everything's fine, but they don't know. Well, it's all uh, an interesting story. And anyway, we all feel so down and out, especially as you see price going down uh, several days in a row. But yeah, I mean, gold uh, as we speak is up $100 year to date. I mean, it began the year at 1829 and is about 1929 or whatever it is as we record this uh, on track to kind of match its average annual gain since the year 2000. If you think of it as a new century, I think that gold is annualized about nine and a half percent in dollar terms every year. Um, so we're on anyway. So you look at that and think, OK, what's well, doing what it's supposed to do? And yet, well, we all kind of feel downtrodden, and and I and I do as well. I'm not trying to say I don't. It is uh, frustrating to watch, but again, the idea that this year was going to play out similar to other years in the past, where the Fed entered the year with rhetoric of higher rates, and then ended the year uh, moving toward lower rates, um, certainly seemed to be playing out that way. The only frustration is in this. This delay, this waiting for everybody to get on board that the Fed is cutting. Now, at present, the notion is that uh, there's not going to be any rate cuts now this year at all. That's what the market's been adjusting to for the last week. And that you know all the rate cuts are going to come next year. If that, even that's a radical change from what I was expecting or what the Fed funds futures markets were pricing in as of a week ago. And we'll see. I, I'm not ready to say that they run up the white flag and say this whole year is lost and the Fed is going to keep rates where they are all the way through Christmas time. There's a lot of year to go and a lot of economic certain uncertainty uh, that is still coming at us. But I guess the main thing that people should understand is the Fed themselves are predicting some rather dramatic economic events in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, Elijah, the Fed meeting last week was obviously the one in June. And on those quarterly meetings, March, June, September, and December, the Fed puts out what they call their summary of economic projections. Now, you can say, well, you know, whatever. These are just a bunch of academics, you know, most of whom have never held a job outside of the Fed. And who cares what their projections are? But they all get together and they all make their little guesswork based off their own, you know, regional bank statistic, statisticians and econ economists, what they're telling them. And there's two things that kind of got glossed over in all of this. Uh, on that official Fed policy statement, that summary of economic projections, they state that from the current 3.7% unemployment rate, to the end of next year, they're projecting that to rise to four and a half percent. Now you think, well, that's not much. That's not even one percent. But on a percentage basis, that's a change of 21 percent. This is not a small little detail. The Fed themselves projecting that the unemployment rate is going to go up by 21 percent. How many people is that putting out of work? Maybe even more important. All this hubbub about the Fed, oh, now they're going to hike in July and maybe again in the fall. The Fed themselves projects 100 basis points of rate cuts in 2024 and 125 basis points of rate cuts in 25. So the hard part is getting kind of caught up in the minute and the, you know, the red prices that you see you know, every day this week. And instead, focus on the bigger picture. And that's, I think, where gold and silver investors need to remain. Yeah, I mean, that has been my forecast all along, is that by summertime, it'd be pretty obvious that the economy is slowing and that the Fed would pause, pivot and start cutting rates. And till last week, uh, this was not an unusual position. Uh, the, the Fed funds futures were projecting the first cut as soon as September and another one in December. So my position wasn't really that radical. I mean, it's not like, I mean, I just kind of came up with it on my own, but it ends up being in line with what uh, the market, if you will, was saying. Now, again, hey, look, I'm, you know, who am I? I'm just this, you know, guy with a computer out here in the middle of nowhere that has a platform to speak. I could be wrong. Uh, Fed funds futures traders, they could be wrong as well. And maybe, the, you know, maybe everything's fine. Maybe the economy just keeps rolling along. 
and inflation, you know, remains high and the Fed keeps on hiking and we end the year with a Fed funds rate of 6%. Uh, maybe. And if that's the case, the back half of this year, probably going to be more like the first half of this year and not much fun for all of us. Uh, however, um, the Fed on this rate hike cycle has hiked rates faster than they ever have, ever. Uh, and so you can look at that and say, well, they don't really know exactly what the outcome is going to be. I mean, they can project and pretend and go off of whatever indicators they want and say everything's fine, but they don't know. I mean, as, go back to March, Elijah. March 7, uh, Powell's on Capitol Hill given his semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony. And on that meeting, he was talking about higher for longer. And maybe in the March meeting, they were going to hike 50 basis points and all that stuff. About four days later, here came the problems at Silicon Valley Bank. So that would suggest Powell had no idea that the Silicon Valley Bank issue was pending, that this caught the Fed by surprise. It certainly seems now in hindsight, Mary Daly at San Francisco Fed had no idea what was going on. And of course, we know Silicon Valley Bank was quickly followed by the third and the fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history, Silicon Valley being the second largest. So this idea that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, the Fed thinks everything's just fine. Um, okay, but that can be turned upside down pretty quick. Uh, you know, and, you know, the Silver Institute has put out those studies of, you know, last year, a $247 million supply or million ounce supply deficit, that sort of thing. And again, all these things factor in. Um, the paper price gets pushed down. It gets unprofitable to mine it. Um, you know, now silver is kind of a different animal because a lot of silver is pulled out of the ground uh, in as a basis of other mining, copper and nickel and lead and the like. Silver just kind of comes out with it as a byproduct. But nonetheless, I mean, there is kind of this physical factor that eventually impacts how low a silver price can go. I mean, you know, it's like oh, it could go to ten. Sure. Uh, I suppose it could. I could also probably, you know, come up with some theoretical physics that would say that, you know, you could pick up an elephant and throw it. But that's, again, a, your experience, your understanding, your wisdom knows that that's really not the case. And I just don't think there's physical silver to be delivered in London at $10 an ounce.